Welcome, and thanks for joining with AIP, the American Institute of Pyramid Research. We study pyramids around the world, especially in Egypt, with the belief they hold special wisdom. Please subscribe to our channel as we uncover long hidden secrets, explain sacred symbols, and demystify the world's greatest mysteries. Okay, number nine. From the Giza Prophecy, a book by Scott Crichton and Gary Osborne. Okay, this is sort of the circle that they show there. This is like in its simplest form. So it's a circle that touches the outside of the pyramids and also the Sphinx. But more specifically, I, I drew it out on graph paper because they say you can do this. If you lay out on the graph paper the three Giza stars, which I did, you can see the green star for Al-Nitak, Al-Nilam, and Mintaka. Okay, so you, you draw a straight line through Al-Nitak and Al-Nilam. You take it so it goes alongside Mintaka. Then you go through Mintaka and extend that line, double it, and then draw the, you know, the parallelogram back. And uh, so basically you can see that now the circle touches the outside satellite pyramid and it goes through a slightly different spot of the Sphinx by doing that. But again, there's no way that you would have this circle touching like that if there wasn't some kind of unified plan. Okay, now another one from the Giza Prophecy by Crichton and Osborne. Now you can see here we've got you know a sort of a blurry map of the timeline when the pyramids were built. Well, there's a timeline on Osborne's, basically his unified Giza plan here. This is a prophetic chronograph. So if you look at the, on the left there, the minimum culmination of when um, the, the constellation Orion set at minimum culmination, thinking of the precession of the equinoxes, it hits down there, and in its maximum, 2500 CE, the, it came to where the Queen's uh, pyramids are at Khufu. So that's, you know, the half of the precessional cycle, 13,000 years. Well, interestingly enough, if you take the exact center of that line, it's perfectly lined up with the Sphinx north and south. This is a time machine. This is a time machine. So again, if you line that up with Leo to the Sphinx there, and then where the uh, minimum and maximum uh, culmination of Orion as a constellation are, and any point on that line now that's formed would be a date. Unbelievable. So that would be a date. That would be a date. That would be a date. That's about where we are in time right now. Super interesting. An 11th unified Giza plan, Ed Nightingale's book about uh, the, the, this being a, a, a template, which he says is based on the word temple. So he starts, uh, Ed Nightingale starts with the idea from the bottom up. He says, well, how would they have done it? So he says, well, they square the circle because the Great Pyramid squares the circle. So they would have started with a circle, you know, with, with a uh, diameter of nine, but next to a square of eight. 64. So the area of the square is just about equal to the area of that circle. So starting with this practical beginning, he lays out structure one, you know, the Great Pyramid, and structure two, Khafre, uh, three, and then seven, eight, and nine. He puts, he puts all these in there just based on building it from the ground up, not by measuring what's at Giza, by first plotting out what would be there. But then once he does that, he lays it on top of the Great Pyramid, and he shows, you know, where the King's Chamber would be, and the Grand Gallery and all that stuff. Then he takes uh, what he did. He, he first takes a quick, quick, quick bird satellite image of the Giza Plateau, where there's almost no distortion, unlike Google Earth, and then plots down all those points he just calculated and shows it fits perfectly. Then that plan on quick bird fits Google Earth. That's what he shows. It agrees with Google Earth. Then he takes Petri's tr famous triangulation diagram of the Giza Plateau, and he basically shows it agrees with his quick bird uh, view. But he shows it doesn't agree with Petri's data. Interesting. Interesting. He show In his plan, it's the Khafre Temple, that point in red there that's the center of, of his outworking there. Again, a separate 
Giza unified plan, but it all works. Okay, so he finds this Fibonacci spiral there. And it's interesting, the center of the Fibonacci spiral, I think this is so interesting, is outside the Sphinx. You'd think it would be in the Sphinx, but that point right there is a, a spot where many people view the Sphinx publicly. So the center of his plan, which was built by a human being from the ground up before he looked at what's at Giza, the center of the Fibonacci spiral is us. It's the observer, not the wealthy observer who pays you know, the thousands of dollars to actually go inside the Sphinx. From the outside public viewing area, that's the center of the Fibonacci spiral. Unbelievable. And now, speaking of Fibonacci, there's, here's a 12th unified Giza plan, the Fibonacci spiral that Rocky McCallum found that I've done some work with. If you follow my videos, I, I expand it a little bit here. That's why it looks a little bit out of proportion. But uh, I'm going to be in a couple weeks and I'm there. I'm going to be going to the origin of the Fibonacci spiral that goes through all three pyramids in Giza. There's not a way in the world that could be by chance. A Fibonacci spiral follows a very definite mathematical and geometric uh, configuration. We know that. And there's no way one would go through them if, if they, by chance. The three that's not a circle that goes through them. You know, that's a, that's a Fibonacci spiral. Unbelievable. A 13th unified Giza plan, okay? And uh, so right here we're looking at a Google Earth shot of the AIP pyramid, the five times the size of the Great Pyramid pyramid that exists on the Giza Plateau. But what I did with this is overlay the Da Vinci overlay because the AIP, AIP pyramid was number five. So 13 is different because we're looking at the AIP pyramid but in conjunction with Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, which Alan Green and Robert Grant have shown Da Vinci meant to indicate the Great Pyramid by the horizontal lines on his Vitruvian Man. They all match up with lines in the Great Pyramid. So all I did was take the AIP Pyramid, which is on the soil at Giza, and I superimposed, uh, again with the help of talented graphic artist Will Wire, uh, this on the Giza Plateau and found interesting things such as this that the uh, upper horizontal corresponds with the boat pit that upper chakra where no known chamber exists but Da Vinci sort of implies and Alan Green implies there could be a chamber up there and it, that upper chamber goes right where the solar boat pit is the boat that the king takes to go to the next life Interesting. Right there. All right. The Orion Correlation Tour I'm going to be leading in April. And, you know, it's not filling up the way I'd hoped. I only want to take a small group of people. So I'm hoping a couple more people sign up so we can make this thing a go. Please. April 19th through 25th, join me on the Orion Correlation Tour. We're looking at the stars of the constellation Orion and where they land on the Egyptian soil. As far as I know, I'm the only person in the world who's written a book about all the stars of Orion and where they come on Egypt's soil. Robert Bavall started the theory decades ago about how the three belt stars of Orion are associated with the three big pyramids in Giza, but I look at all the places on Egyptian soil where those stars land. So we're going to go to see the stars in the Fayum Oasis, camp out at night, stay in five-star hotels on the other nights, going to have good food, good fellowship, and an intimate time together. Please come on the Orion Correlation Tour with me, will you? April 19th through 25th.